Once upon a time in Hollywood, Quentin Tarantino was at the top of the IT list, the hottest director in town. Fresh off his breakout masterpiece, Pulp Fiction, in 1994, he was everywhere. You couldn't miss him. Winning awards. Thanks. <laughs> acting in movies. You can call me Johnny. I was hoping to have a word with you about the sorry state of this establishment. Writing movies. I love you, Mickey. Me, <laughs> <Being> Mallory. <laughs> Appearing on sitcoms. See, you gotta plunge it in, you know, just to, you know, get through that breastbone. <laughs> and yucking it up on talk shows. Thing. I'm a big Baywatch fan. Every week. Not every, actually, no, I, 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 I watch it quite a bit, but I actually watch a lot of it in Europe. He was the personification of 90s cool. It's fucking Kristoff. Yes. Everything else is piss. And he was responsible for all the pop culture referencing indie flicks that followed. Fans of Pulp Fiction and Get Shorty will love Frogs for Snakes. It's not right and it's not fucking fair. When the hype storm finally died down, it was time for Tarantino to embark on his much anticipated follow-up to Pulp Fiction. Well, let's not start sucking each other's dicks quite yet. He could have easily gone down the same route with the retread of his previous work, as so many of his copycats did. Drop the gun, asshole. Look, why don't you drop your gun? I don't drop my fucking gun, okay? Instead, he subverted expectations by making a low-key, character-driven crime caper based on a book. Now that was a good idea. Thank you. Tarantino put his stamp on the story, and it became... Brown. Jackie Brown. It's a movie that expertly blends style with substance, and it features the smartest dialogue of his career. Royale with cheese notwithstanding. You know what they call a, a, a quarter pounder with cheese uh, in Paris? What do they call it? They call it a Royale with cheese. Royale with cheese. That's Pulp Fiction was as different from Reservoir Dogs as Jackie Brown is different from Pulp Fiction, but you can tell I made all three of them. That's there. But they all have different things about them. This is the movie I became a professional. I've always this movie, Jackie this movie, Brown. Jackie Brown. I've always considered myself, you know, an amateur, and I'm kind of proud of that amateur status. I had a little worries moment, actually, in pre-production of Jackie Brown, of like, oh my God, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a professional. Booyah! I'm just gonna go right out and say it. Jackie Brown is hands down Tarantino's best film. Is that a fact? Yeah, that's right. Best film. Really? The cinematography, the acting, the music, and obviously the screenplay. It's all first rate. Shit, I'm impressed. The movie's greatness is due in no small part to the inspired collaboration between Tarantino and this man, Elmore Leonard, one of America's most celebrated crime novelists. He's known for sharp dialogue, rough edges, and grammatical liberties. Leonard said himself, I try to leave out the parts that readers tend to skip. Some of his books, such as the crime comedies Get Shorty and its sequel Be Cool, read like entertaining screenplays. Where's my coat? It's not one of these. Well, do you see a black leather jacket? Fingertip length, like the one Pacino wore on Serpico? Because if you don't, you owe me $379. That's why his material is ripe for adaptation and is such a popular source for both TV and movies. So maybe you didn't see the sign. I seen the sign, but I didn't come to sunny Florida to freeze my ass off. You got that? His novel, Rum Punch, hit shelves in 1992 and caught the eye of Tarantino, who acquired the film rights after the success of Pulp Fiction. The story centers on a stewardess named Jackie Burke, who's at a crossroads in her life. Playing on both sides of the law, she hatches a risky plan to steal a large sum of money from a dangerous drug dealer. 
Although Jackie was described as having blonde hair, Tarantino imagined her as a black woman when he read the book, a Pam Greer type. In fact, he imagined Pam Greer herself. Black and stacked and packed with fury. I know what you want to, and you're gonna get it. Greer is the face of 1970s black exploitation cinema, starring and kicking butt in Coffee, Friday Foster, and Foxy Brown. Have no fear, Pam Greer is here as Foxy. Foxy Brown, rated R. Being the student of cinema that he is, Tarantino drew on his love of black exploitation movies and found a way to merge them with the Elmore Leonard material while adding his own distinctive touch. I think he respected the material and he wanted to use what he could and he found out that he could use perhaps more than expected. Thus the surname Burke was dropped and Rum Punch became Jackie Brown. One day he calls and he says, look, I'm gonna send you something. Mm -hmm. You know, um, read the role of Jackie Brown. Tell me what you think. And I started reading it. Elmo Leonard is one of the most prolific writers. I mean, you can smell and taste and feel his characters on the page. And now they're popping out. And Quentin, stop. I'm, it's like so mind-boggling. I'm gonna have to read it again. And I'm just overwhelmed. I mean, by the sheer fact that someone would sit down and write something for me. I didn't tell him, Leonard, uh, that I was placing in the, the film in the South Bay. I didn't tell him I was changing Jackie to black or anything. I just kind of talked to him about the piece a little bit and asked him some questions. He said, I've been afraid to call you for the last year. And I said, why? Because you've changed the title and the uh, color of the main character? And he said, yeah. I said, well, that's all right. <laughs> Do what you want. You're the filmmaker. The casting alone is perfection. Joining Pam Greer is Robert Forster as Max Cherry. Oh, this is Max Cherry, Cherry Bail Bonds. Who's this, please? A bail bondsman who's been in the game a few years too long. I'm sitting on his couch in the dark, holding my stun gun. The whole house smells of cat pee. And after a couple of hours, I think, what am I doing this? It's 19 years of this shit? And Sam Jackson is Ordell Roby. O-R-D-E-L-L-R-O-B-B-I-E. -L -L -E. A gun-running criminal who will protect his money by any means necessary. Who's that? An employee I had to let go. Well, everybody knows your famous lines from Pulp Fiction. I mean, they're, they're icons of <laughs> cinema. But you know, I really love um, one of the other Quentin Tarantino films you did, Jackie Brown, which is just has such yeah. a terrific cast and and a great awesome movie. Yeah, uh, and a, and a great role for you. You want to describe your character, Odell Roby? Odell is a um, <laughs> um, hustler of sorts. You know, he would call himself a gun dealer when you meet him in this particular film. But he's you know more or less a more or less a hustler who um, lived on the streets, lived by his wits his whole life, done some time in prison. Uh, who is a very affable and funny kind of guy, but extremely dangerous. The other supporting actors include a nearly unrecognizable Robert De Niro as Lewis, a shabby schlub newly released from prison. Bridget Fonda as Melanie, Ordell's pot-smoking beach bunny girlfriend, but not his girlfriend. Like, you know, what, what, what is she to you? You know, she just wanted the bitches I got set up. Michael Bowen as LAPD Detective Mark Dargis. Look, Miss Brown, we don't give a fuck about you. And Michael Keaton as ATF agent Ray Nicolette. Jackie, I hope you don't mind if I call you Jackie. Interesting side note, Keaton would go on to reprise this role in Steven Soderbergh's Out of Sight. Another solid Elmore Leonard adaptation, which came out about six months after this one. Yeah, this is Ray Nicolette. Hey, hi. Hi. Pleasure to meet you. I heard a lot about you. Likewise. Tarantino calls Jackie Brown his hangout movie. How are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Yeah, yes, you are. <laughs> There's a vibe of relaxation. Often, the characters are hanging around, chilling out, sipping on a drink, smoking pot,
talking about whatever. You know, you smoke too much of that shit. That shit's gonna rob you of your ambition. Not if your ambition is to get high and watch TV. <laughs> The movie begins on this note, with Ordell, Lewis, and Melanie watching a smutty firearms video. Uh, 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 here we go. AK-47, the very best there is. When you absolutely, positively got to kill every motherfucker in the room, except no substitutes. Nothing gets between me and my AK. <laughs> To duck from the watchful eyes of the ATF, Ordell uses couriers to run his money. When one of his guys, Beaumont, is arrested, Beaumont Livingston, Ordell enlists the service of Max Cherry. You have cash. What do you need me for? Come on, man, you know how they do. Black man show up with 10,000 cash, first thing they want to know is where I got it. Beaumont is played by Chris Tucker in another one of the movie's bits of inspired casting. After getting released from jail, Ordell pays him a late night visit and convinces him to help him on a quick job as a thank you. All I'm asking you to do is get in the trunk, hold this fucking shotgun, and point it at these bullet heads when I open You catch your nigga off guard with this shit. Listen to Ordell's skillful manipulation here. Look here, look here, look here. I tell you what, when we get through fucking with these go rings, me and you go to Roscoe Chicken and Waffle on me. Think about it now. That skull special, smothered in gravy and onions, side of red beans and rice and greens. <laughs> That's some good eating. The violence that's so prevalent in Pulp Fiction and in later films like Kill Bill is understated here. The action has a deliberate, gradual pace. In this key scene, Ordell slams the trunk on Beaumont. Hey, you say ten minutes. Hey, motherfucker, you ain't hit my goddamn head. Your ponytail wearing motherfucker. Slips into the front seat of his car and puts on a Brothers Johnson tape to get in the zone. We follow him as he drives to a hidden spot before the camera cranes upward and from afar, we see him exit open the trunk, and cut short Beaumont's angry whining with a couple of quick successive gunshots. It's a cold execution, and Tarantino's methodical approach to the scene emphasizes that. Similar to Francis McDormand's delayed entrance in Fargo. Oh, gee. Thought you might need a little warm up. Thanks a bunch. The character of Jackie Brown is formally introduced about a half hour into the movie. As in the novel, she's a stewardess for a crappy airline and one of Ordell's other couriers. On a routine run, Jackie is intercepted by ATF agent Nicolette and Detective Dargis. In her luggage bag, they find Ordell's cash, and unbeknownst to her, What's this? A bag of coke. What's that shit? So it's off to jail. They set a bond this afternoon at $10,000. Now I'm figuring you can take that $10,000 you owe me from Beaumont, move it over to the stewardess. As per bondsman protocol, Max goes to pick her up. Dropping off Lopez, Anita, picking up Brown, Jackie. The following sequence, as Max first lays eyes on Jackie as she emerges from jail, is an example of the smooth melding of Elmore Leonard's words and Tarantino's vision. Tarantino has clarified that this is not a falling in love shot. Rather, it's a behold the power of Jackie shot. Max invites her out for a drink. He takes her to a dark, divey sports bar as per her request. No thanks, I quit three years ago. Gain weight? 10 pounds. I take it off and put it back on. <laughs> That's why I don't quit. Jackie inquires about her bail. Max tells her Ordell paid it, same as Beaumont. Later that night, 
when Ardell pays her a visit with murderous intentions, she's prepared. What the hell's wrong with you, Jackie? Shut the fuck up and don't you move. She quickly takes control. The way I see it, you and me got one motherfucking thing to talk about. One thing. And that's what you are willing to do for me. I can get your lawyer. Oh, no, l let's be realistic. Now, sooner or later, they're going to get around to offering me a plea deal. And you know that. That's why you came here to kill me. <laughs> I ain't come over here oh, to no, kill you. Okay. It's okay. Now, I forgive you. They negotiate a deal that will go down like this. Jackie will pretend that she's working for the authorities. Well, how can you help us? Well, hey, I'll do anything I can to help you get his ass. And smuggle Ordell's last big cash haul of 550 grand. But she'll tell Agent Nicolette and Detective Dargis that the amount is only 50 grand. And that's the amount she'll let them catch her with. Ever been tempted? If I did, I'd have to give one to you, wouldn't I? Then she'll take her cut and Ordell will retire. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jackie and Max devise another plan entirely. I'm not sure you answered my question, Max. Which one? If you had the chance, unemployed now, to walk away with a half million dollars, would you take it? The big transfer, which takes place inside a bustling shopping mall, is handled in typical Tarantino fashion with multiple perspectives. I mean, you wear that suit to a business meeting and you'll be the badass in the room. Yeah, I think I like it. I'll take it. I'm going to hurry. Can you ring it up for me? Cash or charge? Cash. Yeah, I'm going to hurry. Can you ring it up for me? Cash or charge? Cash. Nice outfit on her. Nice I think I like it. I'll take it. I'm in a hurry. Can you ring it up for me? Cash or charge? Cash. The scene also features a repurposed suspense score from Roy Ayers. And there's lots of fancy camera work. Jackie Brown contains many small, powerful moments. Characters are given time to think and react. It's Jackie Brown. And the plot doesn't always go where you expect it to go. Jesus, but if you two aren't the biggest pair of fuck-ups I've ever met in my entire life. The acting all around is superb. Hey, don't say... Don't say anything else, okay? Keep your mouth shut. Thankfully, Tarantino didn't cast himself this time. Jimmy, she ain't gonna leave me. Don't fucking Jimmy me, Jules, okay? In an on-screen role, that is. You have one message, and at 8.06 p.m. And thankfully, he didn't attempt an Australian accent. I said a hey, white boy. Shut up, Black. You ain't got nothing to say I want to hear. How'd you like to make $11,000? The fuck are you talking about? His on-screen absence is all the more surprising because he was hit with the acting bug big time in the mid to late 90s. Even starring in a Broadway play called Wait Until Dark with Marissa Tomei. To tell you the truth, I really, really like the idea of, uh, of like, okay, you want to go in, you, you want to go into acting, all right, in a big way, all right, well, there's a stage. All right, you know, that's, that's, that's the actor's medium. It's right there, man. You know, you are there every night, all right? And there you go. The reviewer from the New York Daily News pointed out that while brilliant as a filmmaker, his onstage acting has the expressive power of a fence post and the charisma of a weak old head of lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> In lay terms, bad actor, good director. Okay, ready? Everybody settle and action. Pam Greer is Jackie Brown. Pam Greer is Jackie Brown. Pamela Greer is Jackie Brown. Although Jackie Brown takes place in then present day Los Angeles around 1995, there are homages to 1970s cinema all over the place. First, 
There's the familiar funky title font and the borrowed theme song from Across 110th Street by Bobby Womack. Then there's the Brian De Palma like split screen sequence. Is that what I think it is? Plus, there's all kinds of other fun touches, like subtle movie references. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. You wanna fuck? Wanna fuck? Yeah. I'll send you a postcard. And there's the ironic casting of Sid Haig. You know, studs, that could be you if you like to talk. I'm gonna set Bond at 10,000 and set the date of August 21st for the prelim. Your Honor, when will that be? That's six weeks from now, Miss Brown. We'll continue this matter then. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of uh, black exploitation films. I love black cinema and everything. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, you know, I mean, this movie is what it is. It's not a black exploitation movie, you know, it's just, no. it, it takes a, yeah. its tone from yes. that. The soundtrack is one of Tarantino's most eclectic, ranging from Johnny Cash. He had the nerve and he had the blood, there never was a horse like that. To the grassroots. <laughs> to rapper Foxy Brown. The songs are used as quasi-character anthems, and they're often diegetic. I know you like the Delphonics. They're pretty good. Jackie Brown is about as good as movies get. It moves along smoothly and comes together as a very entertaining package. You have no idea what happened with $50,000. You're clueless about the money, right? You have no idea what the 50 grand. No, I know no nothing, clue. not You're a clue. Not I don't idea. have an idea not, where the motherfucking money is. Little. Even with all the hanging out, it never drags. Coffee's good, it gets you higher. You definitely know a lot about that. The story is central, with a satisfying beginning, middle, and end. You're taking a hell of a chance, kid. Yeah, but I'm not in jail, and at least I try. It's certainly not as meandering or over the top as Tarantino's later work, such as Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I know how bored and restless you get when you run out of tamales. <laughs> and every character is smart, with dialogue to match. We're partners. I'm 56 years old. I can't blame anybody for anything I do. This guy's great. Every single picture that he's made has the same high quality dialogue. Now that's very special. Not many, not many writers can do it, obviously. Jackie Brown was always meant to go, I wasn't, I never had any intention of trying to top Pulp Fiction with Jackie Brown. I wanted to go underneath Pulp Fiction with Jackie Brown, all right? I was trying to just dig deeper into character and entrench myself more. And with this arrest hanging over my head, Max, I'm scared. And if I lose this job, I gotta start all over again, and I ain't got nothing to start over with. I'll be stuck with whatever I can get. And that shit is more scary than Ordell. It's like the kind of thing, like if I had done Jackie Brown when I was like 48, everyone was like, oh, look at this mature Tarantino, you know? Uh, Ah, oh, this is, you know, see, he's, he's maturing in such a, you know, wonderful way as he's getting older. Well, I could do that, motherfucker, I could do that shit right after Pulp Fiction. I didn't need to get older to do that. For centuries, Americans have gathered together to celebrate the holidays, reaffirm family ties, and wish goodwill to all men. But this Christmas... Santa's got a brand new bag. Where you going? Del Amo Mall, catch a movie, get something to eat. What you gonna see? Something that starts soon and looks good. Ooh, have fun. Jackie Brown hit theaters on Christmas Day, 1997. But unfortunately, another movie that had just opened would come to dominate the holiday season, 
and uh, freeze the competition. Titanic is doing big business. It's spurred album sales and a run on bookstores for something, anything Titanic. Jackie Brown would go on to make a modest sum at the box office. At the time, I don't know if audiences wanted Pulp Fiction 2 or if they were just satisfied with movies named Titanic. Either way, it came and went faster than you'd expect for Tarantino's third feature film. The reviews were generally favorable, with most of the accolades going to the performances of Pam Greer and Robert Forster. Quentin allowed me to go certain places as an actor that no other director would, would, had required or asked. So many dimensions to Jackie. At the end of the day, all I wanted to do was a good job. Pam is good. Pam, I've known for a long time. I saw a lot of her old movies. She was in exploitation uh, action pictures, and so was I during that period. And I think that's where Quentin uh, decided he liked us. Uh, so he probably has had a feeling for both of us that uh, one of these days he was going to do something for us, and, and look what he did. What a Christmas present. Throughout the 90s, Pam Greer was relegated to unsubstantial supporting roles in sci-fi and action movies. I'm sorry I have to call you at work, but the boys haven't been home in two nights, and I don't know what to do. Listen, sweetie, you're doing the best you can. It's like that age. And in Robert Forster's case, unsubstantial supporting roles in cheesy B-movies. Look, this isn't just some hasty picnic anymore. It's a major news story and a chance for you to talk about law and order. All right, TV, yes. Glasses? No glasses. But that was all about to change. When award season rolled along, Greer was up for Best Actress at the Golden Globes. And Forster received a surprise Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actor. Pretty cool. On Bill Maher's podcast in 2022, Tarantino told a story about a well-known financier who came up to him on an airplane. He asked him if he regretted casting Jackie Brown that way, reasoning that the movie could have made way more money with bigger stars. Tarantino's reaction? Who cares? It was the right cast, and the movie did okay anyway. This is 1997. Who would have been the stars of the day in that year if you wanted to, you know, star oh, fuck no, no, cast no. it. Well, like, I, who, like, I the, can tell you, I who, can... like, who were they suggesting? Like, Robert Foster, who would, well, no, in no. 1997, would, no, would have been, been that 45-year-old? No, in 97, no, I'll tell you exactly. It would have been Angela Bassett and Robert De Niro. I gotta say, I think this guy's got a point. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's got a fucking point. I hate to say it. Jackie Brown has plenty of admirers, but it's still not as high profile as it should be in regards to Tarantino's filmography. It's as underpraised as Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was overpraised. It seems to be the one movie of his that people haven't gotten around to watching yet. Or they watched it once a long time ago on VHS and they weren't that enthused about it. Now, I hate to end this by giving Tarantino a bigger head than he already has. I don't mean I have a big ego, okay, because I don't, all right? I mean, my actual head is huge, all right? But I have to say one more time, Jackie Brown is awesome. Go watch it again. All right, that's all.